Martha Ogle, who is at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She is the professor and the head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And she also has appointments in other medicine departments, including pediatrics, and she is the director of their Stem Cell Institute. I have pulled up her website and I'm looking at the list of honors and awards that she has won throughout her very, very prestigious career. And she has received uh, fellowships and awards and grants at every level in every institution she's ever been at. She's received an NSF Career Award when she was a junior faculty member. She's received multiple awards as well for leadership and mentorship, which I think is always a, a wonderful sign that somebody does such cool science and is so involved with uh, trainees and, and generating the next generation of researchers. Um, she has hundreds of publications. And uh, I know she's been at Minnesota for a few years at least because I actually met Brenda when I interviewed uh, to potentially move to her lab as a postdoc. So this is kind of a full circle moment for me, which is why it's, I'm so excited you got to, to do this seminar. I'm just sorry that you couldn't actually come to Alabama. Uh, so maybe, maybe next time, because our weather's a little better here than, than in Minnesota. Uh, so Dr. Ogle's research lab uh, focuses on, um, excuse me, I had it all pulled up here and it just completely went out of the way. She does uh, cardiac tissue engineering. She uses stem cells. She does a lot of extracellular matrix studies as well. Um, and today she's actually going to talk about her strategies for 3D printing complex cardiac tissue mimics. So I turn the floor over to you, Dr. Ogle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And yes, it is does feel full circle. I missed out on you, but it's fun to be able to uh, see each other in different realms and then share our work. So um, I will just jump in. And as um, you heard Mary Catherine say, I am interested in stem cells and how they might be used to generate cardiac tissue mimics. And for that reason, I'm hoping, I know some of you are required to be here, but maybe others are here because you're also as interested in stem cells as I am. And I thought I would share with you a little bit about our Stem Cell Institute just to get started as a way to um, perhaps promote some collaborations between our two departments uh, and associated stem cell entities. So our institute has been around for 20 years. We just celebrated our birthday this year. On the lower right is our, the building in which we have housed about 20 researchers. They actually have their home in departments, but they have their research space in this building. And then there are about another 40 investigators across campus and filtered in through labs, including mine, which is in a different building, but I also have a couple of benches in this building. And for those of you who might be thinking about um, additional steps or opportunities, or for some of the undergrads you may be mentoring or who may be in this call as well, we have an education program there that includes a master's degree. We also have a PhD minor and then a PhD level training grant um, that has really some unique aspects of training across the university. And you can check those out on our web. You know, when I started my uh, academic career, it was about 2006, which was a year before uh, the first dairy. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, okay. now we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so, so it's been, you know, whatever, 15-ish years since that first sort of monumental event. And it's exciting. I know these same sorts of things are happening in Alabama, but we're, we at Minnesota are also starting to see the, the clinical and translational fruition of that monumental event, I'll say. And so I'll just share with you a couple of examples. First, we have um, Deb Farrington whose lab has been working to derive IPS um, derived retinal pigment epithelial cells. And they aren't transplanting these, but instead they're using robots to make patient lines from like hundreds of patients and using those lines to generate RPE cells and then test different combinations and concentrations of different therapeutics before using them in individuals with, in this case, macular degeneration. It's well known that every individual has a slightly different response to the treatments that are available. And so having this as a precursor has been really powerful. And those clinical trials are wrapping up right now as we speak. And then 
We have Ampar, who's been interested in using stem cells to treat spinal cord injury. They're not nearly close to the clinic, but what they have discovered along the way is a means to more rapidly generate neuronal precursors. And so they have a company called Anatomy that is actually housed in the Stem Cell Institute along with four other companies um, to again, provide a commercial product to advance the field um, and also provide an example for other companies, big and small that wanna move into the stem cell space. So we have some of even our bigger companies like Medtronic and 3M that now have spaces there because they wanna to start to understand and they love being part of the community and the network that we have in the Stem Cell Institute. Two last examples, um, Bruce Walchek helped to develop some IPS derived NK cells that are being used to as a cancer therapeutic. Um, and those are actually in clinical trials as we speak. So a cell therapeutic that is derived from a human IPS cell. Um, and similarly, Rita Perlingero has derived um, skeletal muscle progenitor cells, and they are in the phase of generating large batches of clinical grade product in order to start their clinical trial, hopefully next year. So these might not sound like big deals, but to me, like looking 10, 15 years back, it's sort of amazing how far we've come. And, and for me, when I uh, think about my other hat, which is in the department like you're in, biomedical engineering, I think of the sort of next phase of, I don't know, biomedical engineering, at least in our department, goes along what I call a responsive therapy continuum, where responsive medicine means a therapy that responds to the response of a patient to the therapy. I hope that makes some sense, but basically it's an adaptive therapy. Um, and you could think of it as sort of a subset of precision medicine. It might be made for the individual, but that sort of tailoring doesn't come perhaps at the outset, but later in how the device responds to that individual person. So on one end of the spectrum, of course, the most cool application of responsive medicine is regenerative medicine, which is typically involves stem cells and that's what I work on. So I think it's at the pinnacle. That's why I, when I drew this graph, that's how I made it. Um, but on the way, there are lots of very interesting new technologies that can emerge. And because we're in Minneapolis among many med tech and biotech companies, we think about existing therapeutics and how they might be modified to become responsive. So Alex Opitz has been developing a lot of MRI-based tools that utilize machine learning to improve diagnostics. Uh, we also have um, Matt Johnson, who's been working on closed loop therapeutics, including neural stimulators that can actually adjust and respond again to the response of the patient to that stimulation. And finally, Tay Nedoff is developing another kind of uh, electrical stimulation. In this case, uh, a stimulator that's applied uh, near the spine, and they've oh. actually been able to um, uh, recover function, muscle function in individuals with paraplegia, even very long-term uh, uh, paralysis has been restored. I don't know if I can start this movie. It's it's going but this individual you can see is walking with the help of a walker about two months after starting this therapy had been bedridden for 30 years prior to that event. So that's some of what's going on in Minneapolis. This is just to show you where we are because we'd love for you to come visit us. This is our biomedical engineering building is right behind here, linked directly with tunnels because you know sometimes there is snow here. Um, and then on the other side of the river is our downtown and throughout the metro area um, is of the highest concentration of medical device companies in the world actually. So we collaborate with them often and they we influence each other to spur innovation in our space. So with that, let me get to what we do, um, another opportunity for collaboration, I hope, um, and perhaps in the space of cardiac tissue engineering. So you may know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in not only the United States, but the world. Um, I like to think of the heart like a house, um, like other organs in your body it has a structure. It has plumbing and that's just your vessels feeding it to supply nutrients, but it's also unique because it has this electrical system, which is coupled to contractile machinery, which of course allows for the pumping 
of the heart. And these are the master cells that, that provide this function. These are cardiomyocytes and this unique striated pattern that um, indicates the sarcomeres, which is what responds to the electrical propagation of ions between cells and then contracts. The problem with these beauties is that once you lose them, um, you can't recover many of them. And so what happens instead is that you typically get scar formation or other types of fibrosis that lead to poor uh, contraction, therefore poor pump function and eventually dilation and failure of the heart. So because this is a cell type that the body can't replace in ideal scenarios, if we could replace them with cells from outside of the body. And the promise of iPS cells um, and then two enabling technologies make that seem like a possibility in the near future. So the two enabling technologies that I'm thinking about are first efficient differentiation of pluripotent stem cells to cardiomyocytes in a dish. I know several of you in the department work on these, so I'll spare you the beating video up in the right. Um, but that's a pretty efficient process right now. You can get a, you know, around 90 to 95% uh, purity of uh, derivation of this unique cell type in a dish. And then importantly, you can move them. So you can take them off of the dish from once they were derived and put them in another dish like you see down in these images here, 15, 30 and 45 days after differentiation, they can still be moved. And because of that, um, folks have been using this unique cell type to generate model systems. Um, one of the most commonly used today is called an engineered heart tissue. Typically it's uh, the use of an extracellular matrix protein base mixed with these IPS derived cardiomyocytes and put into some kind of mold attached to posts. And they basically compact around the posts um, and then you can look at their contractile function between these posts um, to better understand their degree of maturity and how they might respond to a drug or therapeutic. Um, and this is a really nice model system. It does though rely on uh, compaction of the matrix and the associated cells to form what was once sort of a, a thick glob of engineered tissue into a thin strip. Um, and that compaction is necessary for creating a really high density of cardiomyocytes in that space. A really powerful system, um, but very small. Um, in addition to being able to use those enabling technologies for model systems, people of course also thought about injecting them right back into the heart, especially a damaged heart. This is still ongoing, but really the upshot is even in the best case scenario, which I think is this um, study, which is not from my lab, this is from Chuck Murray's lab in the University of Washington. And this is a cross section of a ventricle. And what you're seeing here outlined with the white dashed lines is where the infarct occurred. And the green stuff here uh, corresponds to GFP positive IPS derived cardiomyocytes that were ejected into this space. And really they saw a tremendous amount of engraftment and it even looks like nice spreading and contribution to the function of the heart. But they also saw lots of ectopic beating sites and so and correspondingly arrhythmia in all of the animals. And so the, the field has sort of been thinking, well, what's wrong here? It could be many things. It could be um, a mixture of different types of cardiomyocytes is causing the problem, perhaps too many nodal like cells. It could be that the cells are immature, so they are spontaneously um, beating in places where they shouldn't be. Um, another alternative is that they aren't well organized. And so um, they don't propagate a signal from one point to another effectively. And so we sort of honed in on that last possibility and thought of ways that we might use custom scaffolds or soluble cues to better organize cardiomyocytes prior to transplantation. So before going there, um, and really this has been the focus of my lab for, from the very beginning, um, is a desire to better understand how this family of extracellular matrix proteins interacts with stem cells. I think all of you know that the family of extracellular matrix proteins resides fittingly in the extracellular space, and that these um, 
Proteins form a wonderful structure for tissue. They guide edges and turns, um, but they're also very potent signal generators. And they do that typically by engaging a transmembrane protein, most often an integrin. And once they engage that integrin, they change the conformation, which enables activation or binding to uh, many intercellular proteins that then enact a sulfate process. And there are more than 300 different ECM proteins in the extracellular space. We probably study about 20 to 30 of them. So if you're looking for a new area of investigation, just pick one of the 200-ish ECM proteins still out there. Um, but what happens once they do engage? Um, we know something about, but it's kind of amazing how little we know. Like we don't know much about why engagement of certain ECM proteins drives a specific behavior and not engagement of other ECM proteins. What we know is that generally when an integrin engages ECM proteins, it tends to form a complex of proteins right underneath the cell membrane called the focal adhesion complex. And then we know a lot about what happens with that complex in relation to its interaction with the cytoskeleton to promote adhesion and also migration. But what we don't know is why or how the ECM signals intracellularly to act as a potent stimulator of differentiation. We were among the first labs to show that if you seed, in this case, mesenchymal stem cells on top of different ECM films that have been added exogenously, that you actually drive differentiation of stem cells and that the differentiation is ECM uh, type specific. So we show that in 2D in 2009 and then in 3D, we show the same thing. And we just find that the, the ECM differentiation outcome is consistent. It's just an augmented response in 3D. And so we thought, well, that's kind of interesting from an engineer's perspective, then if you have a system where particular components for a particular behavior, perhaps there's an optimization problem there and that you could optimize the concentration and composition of ECM proteins to drive specification of a particular cell type. And we became very interested in the cardiomyocyte for the reasons that I told you earlier. Um, but we didn't know exactly where to start because um, when we were looking into this, the, the composition of ECM proteins in the heart, uh, especially with development, which is the time period that we thought we needed to mimic, has not been well defined. And so we took an approach where we selected uh, ECM proteins that we thought represented the major families of ECM proteins, type one collagen to represent fibrillar proteins and type three type four collagen to represent the basement membrane along with laminin 211111, elastin and then fibronectin as a linking protein. And we collaborated with Gary Lyons and Jane Squirrel and Kevin Ellisari at Wisconsin. And they helped us um, obtain uh, embryonic heart sections from these very early time points and therefore very, very small hearts up to two days postnatal. And what I hope you can see from these immunohistochemical stains are uh, the expression pattern from the epicardium, which is shown with this um, barred arrow. And then this bar on the other side represents the endocardium. So this is across the entire thickness of the myocardium. Um, that at least in this case, this is type four collagen, the amount and organization goes up um, substantially with development. It's actually different for elastin, which increases a little bit up to around 14.5 and then starts to decrease and localize around the vessels, but is found um, in very low quantities throughout the myocardium. So this gave us a sense for what's present, what's the relative amount at each individual time point. And then we took that information and I think I'll skip over this, but basically this is just to say, now our methodology in this paper is totally rudimentary. What most people are doing now is utilizing mass spectrometry to get a better um, handle, more extensive handle on different ECM proteins and how they change over time. And actually I've been surprised because um, though mass spec suffers from the fact that you have to actually solubilize the proteins and every ECM protein solubilizes differently. If you just wanna track individual 
ECM proteins over time. This is a really wonderful way to do it. Um, relatively, you know, quantitative, at least for individual proteins over time. So I, I highly, highly recommend that. Anyway, back to my original sort of line of discussion, that optimization problem. We thought, okay, we know what proteins we want to look at. We know sort of the range of concentrations we want to use. Now, how are we going to cover that whole parameter space? And we decided to use a design of experiments approach. Or we basically are going to make an array of a subset of that population, use that statistical tool to generate a theoretical optimum, and then go back and test that experimentally. Uh, we knew we wanted to do it in 3D um, because uh, there have been several studies leading up to that showing the stiff dishes with ECM protein was prone to take you in a completely different direction than where you wanted to go. And then we had seen that uh, differentiation responses were augmented in 3D. So we used this uh, peg-based gel into which we entrapped different combinations and concentrations of ECM proteins. And that's shown here. So we um, entrapped different types of stem cells, uh, depending on the experiment, different ECM proteins. And here's the polyethylene glycol that we used to entrap it. We used one forearm peg uh, modified with a cysteine and the other with a thioester. And then via native chemical ligation, which can happen at neutral pH under mild conditions, we can entrap these little pockets of ECM plus cells. And you can see that it was really um, a powerful tool. You can immediately see by day seven, 1421 with type one collagen, fibrillar collagen, you do get these nice elongated fibrils, the cells um, engage very readily. Similarly with laminin, you eventually develop these reticulate structures as you would expect, and then no ECM, they stay rounded and eventually die. So using that system, we now are entrapping IPS cells and we're trying to back out a, a theoretical optimum that we would uh, confirm or attempt to confirm experimentally. And this little graph here represents a lot of work and it has a very large error bar, which might make some people sad, but it made us so happy because <laughs> what this showed is that with our optimized formulation, try to move this out of the way so I can see it. Um, we could get about 40 to 50% differentiation to cardiomyocytes. So expressing cardiac troponin T. And it was even significantly different than the same uh, ECM proteins, but mixed together at identical concentrations. So the concentration is as important as the, the item or the combination. Um, and then if you don't add any ECM proteins, you don't get any specification. And then interestingly, um, this combination corresponded to a developmental time point that um, is consistent with large amounts of differentiation in the mammalian heart. So all of that really finally came together and it was um, exciting for us. The other exciting thing is that um, it came about at the same time as 3D bioprinting, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. And so basically our optimized formulations, which we're still making now, just easily segued into bio inks. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute, but before I go there, I wanted to share with you some of the early, early results that we have um, in our attempt to understand how ECM engagement actually leads to specification. So I told you before that most of what's known about integrin engagement of ECM is related to cell adhesion and migration. So this are, these are very early and new studies, but what we found is that there are lots of interesting adapter proteins and kinases that associate with an integrin once it's engaged. And what we wanted to know is how it might interface with some very common or typical uh, differentiation pathways. And for cardiomyocytes, especially mesoderm specification, it's the Wnt pathway that's triggered, leads to engagement of these two receptors, which ultimately disrupts this complex and allows beta catenin to transit into the nucleus to turn on. Um, genes that are essential for mesoderm specification. And so we wanted to know, all right, well, if that's the case, I wonder if there is a way that some of these adapter proteins might interact with this 
uh, complex. And what we found is one of them, integrin-linked kinase, actually inhibits GSK3 beta. And in so doing, we thought this might be enough to disrupt the complex. So we did our differentiation again on our optimized ECM. And so we know that ultimately we're giving rise to a large percentage of cardiomyocytes. And indeed we found that beta catenin does transit into the nucleus at day four um, relative to day one. So that's a pretty good sign that, okay, even with ECM engagement, it's still triggering that beta catenin um, endpoint. And then also interestingly, um, phosphorylated ILK or activated ILK also goes up um, from one to four days um, after exposure to that optimized ECM. And this is just a co-IP showing that ILK and GSK3 beta co-localize. And so we went a little bit further. Um, we wanted to see, okay, let's run it again. And this time let's add a few more conditions. Let's look not only at our OPT formulation, but also no ECM. And then just another ECM control. So this should be a negative control fibronectin. And then the GF condition is our optimized ECM plus growth factors. So growth factors that are known, <clears throat> excuse me, to activate the beta catenin pathway. So what we see interestingly is that if you look at beta catenin, like I showed you before with the OPT goes up around three, four days. Um, similarly, uh, the OPT plus growth factor goes up but the other two do not have that significant spike. Um, then if you add, and then the same is true with the phosphate ILK, like I just showed you, it went up with OPT, but it doesn't go up with um, the growth factor and PEG and fibronectin. Then in the presence of the inhibitor, you see that you don't get any of that active beta catenin, but you do eventually in the growth factor condition. It's like it was kind of stymied because it couldn't engage uh, the ECM, but still the growth factors um, stimulated that alternative pathway. Uh, we found something similar if we look at some matrices that we found um, promote endothelial specification. Um, Michaela Hall and my group has been looking at especially some laminin subtypes that are really potent on their own and then um, with uh, activators of the beta catenin pathway um, at promoting endothelial specification. So here on the lower right, you can see these are just um, ECM proteins, not with CHIR, which is an activator of beta catenin. We see a significant increase in endothelial specification with both 111 and 411. Oh, this is just uh, image stacks to show you the, the nice endothelial tube formation that we see with these cells. Then she looked further just to kind of pull the circle um, forward a little and that you could see that another mesodermal cell type um, relies on that, those same intersecting pathways. So if we look at CD31 differentiation um, on uh, laminin 411, but in the presence of some of these inhibitors, you can see that like uh, cardiomyocyte specification, the CPD22 or inhibition of ILK also knocks down specification. In addition, a focal adhesion kinase inhibitor does the same thing. And we have a notch inhibitor that also inhibits, but and none of these fully inhibit specification except IWP2, which blocks uh, the beta catenin pathway and is integrin independent. Um, so you can see that we think there might be multiple pathways related to integrin engagement that are contributing to specification. Um, and in this case, uh, ILK you saw before, focal adhesion kinase similarly, um, but through a more convoluted pathway. And then with notch signaling, you actually have with integrin engagement, especially laminin 411, you get an expression of the notch ligand, which then allows for beta catenin transit into the nucleus. Um, and arterial gene specifications. So all of that to say, there's also still a lot of room for investigation of how engagement of an ECM protein actually leads to cell specification. 
But let me now pivot over to some applications and uh, tissue engineering approaches utilizing some of these ECM proteins and unique ECM combinations. So I won't talk too much about this study, but this is one of the, our first applications in this space. And this was in collaboration with your department head, Jay Zhang. And he um, had this idea that we should utilize it as a bioink, and he helped us with the addition of cells. But the concept was this. Uh, what if we took our uh, ECM formulation and utilized multi-photon based 3D printing to replicate the ECM deposition and spacing found in the myocardium <clears throat> as a means to organize cardiac cell types? And so that was the idea. If you're not familiar with multi-photon based 3D printing, uh, essentially you put the ECM solution in this reservoir and then it includes modified ECM protein. So in our case, we started with gelatin with acrylate just as a proof of concept and with a photo initiator. And then when you expose the laser pulse, the focal volume that is excited is the same one that polymerizes. <clears throat> so wherever you want to create structure, you turn on the laser and wherever you don't, you turn it off. And um, what you can do then is additive manufacturing or type of serial lithography where you're building up um, Z sections, X, Y planes of, um, one at a time. Um, so we could print structures like this and this weird looking structure is basically <clears throat> an image stack of fibronectin staining in the myocardium. <clears throat> and our initial idea was, okay, if we print that, um, Ideally, we can get cells to go in these spaces, which is where the original cells would have been, um, and that that would help to organize or directly couple, end-to-end -end couple cardiomyocytes. But there are a few problems that we ran into. The first one is that we couldn't actually print the cells where we wanted them. We thought we were gonna be able to do that initially because some cell types are not sensitive to this laser and the conditions that we were using. Um, but iPS cells and iPS derived cardiac cell types were. <clears throat> so we needed to be able to seed them after the fact. For that reason, we had to move for, to a simpler structure because when we tried to seed this, the cells just kind of stayed on top or migrated off of the structure. When we switched to a gridded pattern where the size of this compartment corresponds to the average size of the compartments in this rendering, um, we have about 15 microns by 150. And then importantly, these struts are only one micron uh, wide. And so that um, was enabled by this technology which can achieve that resolution. I won't share with you too much about this study because it's an older one, but the upshot is we could well organize these cells in this way. And so hopefully you can see these lines are basically the strut of the 3D printed uh, grids. And then you could see hopefully the spontaneous and synchronous contraction of those cardiac cell types. In this case, cardiomyocytes mixed with smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells. And importantly in this um, organization, you don't get that compaction and contraction um, that we see with the engineered heart tissues, mostly just because of the relative ratios of the smooth muscle cells, which are the ones that can can compact and contract it. So it stayed an intact tissue. Um, the cells that populated those spaces were aligned. And a lot of this uh, electrophysiology was done here um, to show that if you pace it at one side of the tissue, um, it propagates nice and smoothly to the other side and you can pace it up to about three Hertz. And so these uh, tissues, which we eventually termed patches, have been used in in vitro models um, and shown improvement in functionality, we think, in part because of the organization that was conferred. Let me skip over this. Um, so another, interestingly, we never moved on to the optimized bioink because it worked so well for gelatin methacrylate and because we didn't end up using IPS cells. We used IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. So we didn't need that um, optimized ink formulation, but we do need it now for our new model system that we've been generating. And this is a chambered model and it's about a centimeter scale engineered cardiac tissue. 
<clears throat> and the reason that we developed it, a couple of reasons. One, we thought the technology was right for doing this. Two, we wanted a system where we could measure and impose pressure volume dynamics. And third, we had a lot of interest from uh, local companies to be able to test some of their medical devices. So they needed something big enough and they wanted something living and they wanted something human. Um, and that was sort of our charge. And so we started to look at what we could achieve. Um, and the first thing we wanted to know is could we actually print a structure with open chambers using just our uh, optimized ECM formulation? And the thing with this ECM formulation, it's of a very low viscosity. Um, so it's impossible to print in air. We tried to bulk it up with different viscous elements or even just add in high, high concentrations of gelatin methacrylate or other cell-friendly, we thought, um, components. Um, but in fact, we found that the cardiomyocytes or any cell type um, didn't survive very well under those conditions. So that we really wanna stay with a low viscosity bioink. So we started looking in the literature and um, Adam Feinberg's group from Carnegie Mellon was developing this slurry based printing approach and they had shown that they could print a heart-like structure with nice resolution of even trabeculae inside of the chambers. And so we thought that's what we're gonna try. We're gonna see if we can print our bioink in, into a slurry and see if the chambers can be maintained so that we can um, preserve uh, the flow of uh, fluid through an open or through a chambered um, model. And so our template for this um, was a MRI scan of a human heart that was scaled to the size of a mouse heart. And so this is just a quick video showing the printing of that and that's printed upside down. So you can see we have two major vessels at the bottom and then it, it goes down to basically like an apex-like structure. And um, so that worked well. We had intact chambers, um, but the second problem we had is that when we would print cells, especially iPS-derived cardiomyocytes, we, had, we really struggled to achieve any sort of uh, reasonable density and therefore any kind of contiguous muscle function. Again, the longest axis of this structure is about a centimeter and a half. And so we tried all kinds of different things. We call it, tried aggregates of cardiac cells. We tried um, trying to bump up the concentration so much that the cells sheared when they came out. Um, so instead we moved to something different. We decided let's just print with stem cells. We'll allow them to grow and then we'll differentiate them later. Um, and that's what we ended up doing. And we call it in situ differentiation. And that works actually very well. I'm gonna, this, I know this is too small to see, but this is the reference if you wanna go check it out. But we basically did a whole nother series of optimizations for that bioink that included the elements of the optimized bioink from before. This is just showing you in a little more detail what the construct looks like and demonstrating that it can be perfuse. This is a cross section of the template and the print. You can see that the resolution isn't nearly uh, the one micron that we get with multi-photon based uh, printing, but with this extrusion modality into the slurry, it does well enough for us to generate a, an intact, nice uh, structure that can be perfused. And then this is just evidence that yes, indeed, we can get some nice contiguous muscle, muscle and the muscle can function. It's just a macro scale view. We can see them beating readily at the macro scale. Um, this is a cross section to show that we get really nice troponin staining or cardiomyocytes on the exterior surface. We put the white oval in here to show you where the interior surface should be. And you can see that we have almost no cells there. there. That's because we haven't yet um, been perfusing these, uh, what we call H-champs, human chambered muscle pumps. Uh, with culture or hadn't for this paper. We're starting to do it now. This is just some uh, additional staining to show the phenotype and that they're starting at, this is about 60 days after um, uh, generation of the HCHAMP and you can see that they have nice cell junctions, um, ion channels that are expressed later on uh, in maturation. 
some uh, electrical, electromechanical components um, associated with the sarcomeres uh, and T-tubules. Then we also did um, some optical mapping to get a better sense for the degree of um, muscle continuity. Um, and so this is just the outline of one of the HCHAMPs and here is an, an activation time map as well as an action potential duration AD map. In this top one, you can see that it looks like there's a sort of a dead zone. Um, and once we did histology, there are actually cardiomyocytes here. They're just not coupled to this larger, more dominant force. Um, and you can see that optical map here. So the, the flashing you see, this is a voltage sensitive dye that uh, increases in intensity as the voltage signal propagates across the HGM. And you can see if you actually paste these, some of these open zones um, that were once thought to be dead zones actually start to become included in that muscle contraction. So we begin to pace many of these to improve um, maturation and pump function. So this is the spontaneous activity for this one. This is the same H champ just uh, paced on the other side and you can see the, the more robust um, signal and how it, it's really covering the entire structure. So we can do this very routinely now. Uh, we can also measure uh, with our collaborator, Dwayne Townsend, um, pressure volume dynamics. Um, this is of course not plumbed into a system, doesn't have valves. So this is just the movement of fluid into and out of those chambers. Um, but what you can see, and this is what um, gets some clinicians excited is that you start to have some rendering of a pressure and volume loop. And you can see the impact of, for example, um, drug treatments on this pressure volume profile. So of course we want to keep, maintain that, but now be able to move it into a system with perfusion and with valves. And so that's our most recent endeavor is to um, design a bioreactor to house these HCHAMPs so that we can one, improve volume handling, to increase that internal cell viability, and then ultimately to be able to impose volumetric pressure. So we've been collaborating with the Center for Engineering Complex Tissues, and I'll just give them a plug there. The uh, University of Maryland is the group that we're working with and John Fisher's group. Uh, they have made us many, many versions and <laughs> renditions of this bioreactor. Um, but essentially the idea is uh, inlet and outlet perfuses through this, um, through the HCHAMP. And that what we plan to do is have external to those inlet and outlets um, valves that mimic the function of the mitral valve and the aortic valve um, so that we can impose this sort of profile. And then ultimately what we wanna do is add electrical stimulation um, right at the end uh, of that pressure build in order to move the maximum amount of fluid. Here's a little bit more of what it looks like sitting in the incubator. It's very small. Um, we wanted to know one of our first sort of steps in this are, are we actually getting fluid to flow through the heart or through the HCHAMP rather, because we also have this um, outer uh, pathway so that we can keep the external surface of the construct um, uh, able to access nutrients as well. So we did 40 flow MRI, which is a pretty fun thing to do. I haven't done that before for any of our engineered tissues. And you can see that we've got nice uh, flow vectors coming into and then leaving the H champ. So we've got nice perfusion. And consistent with that, we've started to see a significant increase in viability, especially in this inner septal area of the H champ. And so we're pretty excited about uh, our ability to grow muscle on the interior surface as well as the exterior surface. Because when you model this, you just look at sort of what we've achieved now, which is this outer surface. We can get, and we've measured a stroke volumes up to about five microliters per stroke. <clears throat> if we can get cells to grow on the interior surface like this, then we can increase that stroke volume pretty dramatically, double it, and maybe with full thickness, get all the way up to um, the capacity of a mouse heart, which is around 50 to 20 microliters per stroke. So with that, I'll just give you some 
parting thoughts that I have. Hopefully I've conveyed these already, but just to reinforce, um, I think that organization can be imposed um, prior to transplant with cardiac tissue engineering approaches. Um, we saw efficient gap junction formation through and over ECM barriers. They're really nice conduit and carrier because not only do they form structure, but they can be remodeled and moved around by the cell. Um, and we saw cell elongation for improved contractility with limited compaction of that, those patches. Then with our chamber tissue, um, I showed you that we can get proliferation, significant proliferation with subsequent specific differentiation. And this represents in our view, a new type of organoid system, like system. We could sustain those chambers over time that allow us to measure uh, pressure and volume dynamics and also to stimulate that same um, fluctuations or changes in pressure to mimic the physiologic case. Um, we've achieved right now a thickness of about half a millimeter of muscle that we think is relatively contiguous throughout the whole chambered model. Um, and we're hoping for even better as we begin to perfuse it in the bioreactor. And that the really the big boon and the thing that I wanna leave you with is that it's um, a human model for the study of remodeling, especially in the context of induced injury or medical device intervention. And in fact, we're also using this right now as a model of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it's great for that in two ways. One, because HCM is um, often genetically linked. So we can make IPS cells and isogenic controls with specific mutations. And then of course the progression of that disease is largely linked to changes and increases in pressure um, in the heart over time and with age. So with that, uh, I share with you my lab, who of course did this work, um, especially uh, Molly Kupfer and Weihan, who spent endless hours trying to get that ideal formulation and system up and going to generate the HCHAMP. Um, I mentioned uh, collaborators here at UAB that we've had, as well as uh, many others from across the nation and then our funding sources. So with that, I just wanna thank you all and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. That was, that was so fascinating. Um, I say the saddest part of seminars is that we can't actually applaud for you. So we have these little clap emojis that our, our students will use. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a virtual world. It's, it's what yeah. we can do. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions. I know we've got a few faculty members who are on. I think Dr. Lemons is on. Um, and I tend to let the adults, you know, unmute themselves. Uh, and if students, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, put it in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself, that's fine, too. I just don't want about 50 people speaking at once. Danielle, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, uh, that was really great, Dr. Ogle, as always. Um, I had a question regarding the electrical stimulation that you would be doing in your bioreactor. Uh, are you planning on doing a field type stimulation or point stimulation for your uh, printed heart organoid system? We want to do point stimulation, uh, although I have to admit we don't have the, the details worked out. It's what we've been using for during our optical mapping. It's been really nice because we can, well, control the source of and the, the area from whence the original signal comes. We can get the best push uh, out of the bioreactor. This is what we think, but we haven't we haven't even begun to to test it in in parallel. We basically just got the ports set. So we know we can do it and we're really just focused on perfusion right now, um, but eventually that'll be coming on. Awesome, thank you so much. Yep. Any other questions? Um, um, I was gonna ask about the, the CHAMP model. Uh, have you thought about, or do you have anyone working on mixing in um, like IP induced endothelial cells or other cardiac fibroblasts to see if you can really change how the matrix is forming in these models? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question. So the data that I showed with the um, 
iPS derived endothelial cells that's ECM driven is worked by Michaela Hall. And yes, what we're going to be doing is um, printing, including laminins inside the HCHAMP and then seeding the interior wall of endothelial cells with the hope that they will grow in. We've already seen that in some of our models and we're about to publish that. Um, and then for fibroblasts, really interestingly too, um, IPS derived epicardial cells are becoming more and more easy to generate. We've been working with Sean Pelichek's group of Wisconsin and Sophie Givens is working on that work uh, to try to see, you know, we can actually, some of the early studies that are out there show that the interaction between epicardial cells and cardiomyocytes can promote maturation um, and also proliferation if it's the epicardial precursor cells. So what we want to do is instead of mixing them together is just actually see the exterior of the HCHAMP um, to see, you know, can they infiltrate and then remodel. And if they do that in the context of loading, uh, in principle, maybe we can start to mimic some of the things that happen with development. Because we also know that with you know, with ECM, you get better structural integrity. You can also get better maturation. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And we're excited about that too, because it's, um, we haven't included fibroblasts at all. I mean, most of the ECM that we add is added exogenously. And then of course we know we've done studies with mass spec. We know that the ECM is remodeling and, and cardiomyocytes themselves secrete and remodel ECM. But to have the real player in there, the fibroblasts will be exciting. Um, well, uh, students, I still don't see anything in the chat, so that's that's fine. I just want to make sure I haven't missed anyone. With I know these are the days of like massive Zoom fatigue, so no, don't worry. No, but, uh, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon to to speak with us. Um, and I'm going to pull up several of the papers you talked about because I'm very interested in some of these these three D mechanical stimulation models myself. Uh, and if I could have you stay on the line for just a little bit after all of our students exit, so Carrie and I can make sure your paperwork and everything is, is taken care of. Uh, everyone, let's thank our speaker again, and I will see you all next week at 1 p.m. 1:25. Thank you. Thank you.